is my pleasure to welcome and introduce our speaker today, Peter Woodbury. Peter received his undergraduate degree in psychology from Harvard University and his master's degree in social work from Boston University. Peter is an instructor for Atlantic University's integrative imagery course and also maintains a private practice as a psychotherapist and hypnotherapist in Virginia Beach. A student of the Casey readings for over 20 years, Peter is a popular presenter for the ARE on a wide range of topics, presented both locally at the ARE headquarters and in the field. He is fluent in three languages and leads ARE tours to many, many locations. And this last tour that he led, um, one of the places was um, Mancha Pichu, Peru, and I was able to kind of tag along by his pictures on Facebook, so thank you very much, Peter. <laughs> Peter is known for his great sense of humor, his gentle presence, and his wonderful smile. Please welcome Peter Woodbury. Good morning. Good morning. How many of you live here in the North End or live a little farther down? Those of you who don't, I'll tell you about last night. I came home last night about 9 o'clock, and the entire North End was in a blackout. It was a power failure. So I got uh, home to my oven of the house. My phone was dying, and so there was not much to do besides go to bed and start sweating. <laughs> the power went back on, I think, around 7 in the morning. And as I was in my puddle of <laughs> sweat trying to get some sleep, I was fondly uh, recalling my childhood. Um, I tend to talk about my family, uh, some of the stories. Uh, I was fondly remembering my father. Uh, my father was a World War II veteran, and he loved the Army. He loved being in the war. He was born and raised in France and he got to liberate his own hometown. So he was a hero uh, from the war. But uh, my father would talk about how the uh, military was soft, that his upbringing was much harder. And he was right. My father was raised in a Jesuit boarding school in a small town in France with 4 a.m. cold shower, wake up, and uh, reciting prayer in Latin. That was uh, my father's childhood. So when we moved, uh, my mother was Puerto Rican. When we moved to the Caribbean, we get uh, the temperature in St. Thomas in Puerto Rico. It's either hot or extremely hot. <laughs> and so the summers would be sweltering. And when we first got there, we had uh, air conditioning. And so that was nice. We could turn on the air conditioning and go to sleep except when the uh, air conditioners ran out of Freon, uh, that was it. My father had no interest in <laughs> replacing that. And so we learned, I learned how to sweat myself to sleep. As I was recalling that uh, last night, uh, an old skill that I had long since uh, forgotten. But, um, you know, maybe uh, in adolescence, I might have resented a lot of things about my parents, but as I've uh, aged, you know, there's nothing that's all good or all bad, and there's so much about my upbringing that was unusual, but offered uh, tremendous gifts. I think, at essence, my father was trying to teach us detachment, just kind of not being able to survive with whatever is, and having that kind of uh, freedom. So last night was just a, a little reminder. My father would have loved the black <laughs> My father always had his Swiss army knife, uh, matches, and a lemon. <laughs> the reason he had a lemon is that in France you will eat almost anything, but it always needs a little lemon on it. You know? <laughs> when I would go to the beach with my parents, uh, with friends, my father would catch sea urchins and eat them, crack them open with some lemon, eat them and he'd have the goop on his beard embarrassing me in front of, you know, saying, oh, this is my dad, the caveman, <laughs> sea urchin. Now I love sea urchin, uh, you know, it's a Japanese delicacy, so. Uh, so it's just a little bit about uh, last night and kind of where I stand uh, today. 
So um, the topic I chose to speak about today is the New Age. And it's, uh, I hadn't read Deepak Chopra's kind of commentary that you had in your, in your missile, is that what you call it? I mean, I was raised Catholic, so forgive me for these old language. What do you call it? The program, okay. The, get with the program, Peter. And so there was that, and there was the, uh, the reading from Paul Solomon. So I'm not gonna, I have some thoughts about the new age uh, that I've culled from my work with Edgar Casey and just different uh, traditions. Um, now, uh, it's safe to talk here so I can uh, speak in ways I might not speak in other places. Uh, astrology has helped me a lot. Maybe for many of you, it's helped a lot. I had a girlfriend who was a second generation astrologer and she taught me a lot. You know, one of the things is that my basic nature is pretty happy-go-lucky, but my default emotion can oftentimes be anger. So if somebody cuts me off in traffic, I'm like, how dare they? And I get that impulse of anger. And she said, oh, Peter, that's because you have your moon in Aries. You're just going to have to learn to deal with that. And just that little sentence was like, there's nothing wrong with me. I just have moon in Aries. And so I oftentimes think of this ram that's trying to get out of the barn and I have to keep it in the barn. And so it makes me not feel crazy, it's just that I have to be aware of that tendency. Now, more recently I've also learned that I have with um, Pluto on the Ascendant. Now that's a little deeper uh, in the pool of astrology. So Pluto on the Ascendant means that you can look like a mild-mannered shoeshine boy, you can wear your little button-down shirt, but inside you crave intensity and depth. And my work is, you know, I see 25, 30 clients a week, and as soon as they walk in, I say, what brought you here? <laughs> and if they tell me about the weather, I say, that's not what brought you here. We must go deeper. And so, Immediately, I go into great depth about who a person is and what's going uh, on with, with them. And so, let me start in a very Pluto on the ascendant way. We're all a nice group of mild-mannered, shoeshine girls and boys, but let's get this party started. <laughs> so my question to you is, why did they kill Jesus? Why do you believe they did? <laughs> Good question. But if they were to have killed Jesus, let's start with that. Start with that. If they were to have killed Jesus, if the story that we're told, and we can, we'll have, I'm sure you have time here where you'll talk about all the alternative realities that are just as valid. But I'd like to talk about the version that's quite popular. The one that most people believe. Why did they kill this man? Politics. Politics. Say more about that. What was it? What about the politics? He upset the, 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 the standard order of things that were going on at that He upset the order of things? Challenged authority. Challenged authority. Radical ideas. Radical ideas. They were jealous. They were jealous. There was jealousy. Fear. They weren't he was telling people they weren't victims. So the so the predominant idea was that people were victims. He was claiming he was uh, claiming authority, was gathering power uh, over uh, the, the, the the government that's, that's supposed to be in power. He was claiming a, an authority, a higher authority. Yeah. So there was a predominant power structure that he challenged. Would that be fair to say? And what was the, what would you say, were, what was the ideal of the existing power structure? What, were, what was their God, so to speak? A power struggle was what they bought into as their reality. A power struggle. And they weren't able to see beyond that. They weren't able to see beyond that. And Jesus was. And Jesus was. So yeah. he was an alien. So he was alien, and we don't like that which is different. When you're in a power struggle, you're always looking for anything. Yeah. So once again, what was, if we were to say in a word, 
What was the, the guiding principle of the power structure? And what was the guiding principle of Jesus? Orthodoxy and order. Orthodoxy, order, and then Jesus would be unorthodoxy and order. But what was, what was the God? What was the, what was the power structure worshiping? Caesar? I would say greed. Greed. Edgar Casey talks about, you know, when I'm growing up Catholic, it's like there's a whole lot of sin. A whole lot of talking about sin and original sin and all that. And so when I hear the word sin, it just doesn't, you know, it's a, it's a shame-orienting word from Catholicism. But Edgar Casey takes that word and he says, well, all sin is selfishness. Meaning that when you do something that benefits you and hurts another person, that's sin, that's selfishness. And when you think of the other and you share, well, that's the opposite of that. That's caring or love. And so I can live with that. I can live with that concept of, of sin as selfishness. And so would it be fair to say that the predominant structure or authority was selfish, was power-oriented, was self-serving, and that Jesus came to challenge that? It's fair to say that. And I would add that Edgar K., uh, Jesus could be considered the forerunner of the New Age. That he was bringing forth what has become kind of the uh, core beliefs or concepts of the, uh, of the New Age. So that if the old age has to do with selfishness and greed, the New Age has to do with, well, Edgar Casey would call it oneness, the belief that we are all one. Now, Jesus, and I would say, like all of you here, you are very dangerous people. <laughs> do you know that? You're dangerous. There are, they are probably watching you. <laughs> yeah. And why, why are you all here dangerous? What's that? Radicals. You're radical. So we want to contribute to the unity of consciousness. Right. Now, I think that marketing and business is part of this power structure. Jesus and all of you, you're bad for business. You are. I mean, as I look out, you all look very nice, but I don't get a sense that you are uh, fashion horses. I don't get the sense that you were out yesterday at the mall at Nordstrom's buying your stuff. You, you know Charles Eisenstein? He's spoken here. He has not bought a new thing in something like 30 years. He goes to Goodwill to get all his clothes. Now, I, I'm, this is a Brooks Brothers shirt, so I'm safe. So I, I am not going to get killed anytime soon. But Jesus was bad for business. And you all are bad for business. And you know what you all are teaching? Is that this stuff is just stuff. It doesn't really matter. What matters is what's inside. When Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is within, that's a dangerous statement. It's dangerous. Because that means people don't have to go to temple. They don't have to go to church. They can go if they want to but they don't have to. They can connect with God within. Fewer people are going to go to the churches. And in 2,000 years, we're sort of seeing that. But there's been a growth of a new movement, the new age. More people are coming to uh, places like this. Now, let me tell you a story. Several years ago, a very conservative religious group approached the ARE about making a documentary film. And they wanted to make a documentary film about different religious and spiritual traditions. And they wanted the Edgar Casey ARE to be one of those groups, maybe five or six different traditions, and the ARE was going to be one of them. Now, this group had historically been very, very critical of the ARE. Now, Charles Thomas Casey was the director of the ARE at that time, and so he was always a 
kind of uh, seeking peace, you know, the, the, uh, the olive branch. And so he had a dialogue with these people, kind of a cautious dialogue. And the sticking point was about the final say of how the ARE was going to be portrayed in this documentary. Meaning that this group wanted to have the final say. So they wanted to film and film Charles Thomas and film the campus and then take all of that footage and put it into the documentary the way that they wanted. And Charles Thomas would not agree to that. He said, no, we get the final say contractually, legally, over how we're going to be portrayed in this documentary. So this became the sticking point. They met several times to try to resolve that issue, and once it seemed that they were entrenched, it was not going to get resolved. The director of this group who was at the meeting, once he realized that this wasn't going to happen, he let down his hair. And he said, do you know why we don't like you people? When you hear somebody say, you people, yeah. it's not usually a good thing. <laughs> and Mark Thurston was telling me this story, and he said, you know what, I was really curious. Mark Thurston was a director at that time. And he said, I was curious. We were going to have why they hate us revealed. You know, we knew they hated us, but what exactly was it? You know, are we, are we soft on sin? You know, a little, a little harder on sin. Was it, the, was it the belief in reincarnation that really upset them? What was the reason that they uh, hated us, disliked us? And then this man said, the reason we dislike you people is that you dare to teach that everyone has access to God. How dare you? How dare you teach that everyone has access to God? And they stood up and stormed out of the room. And I'm here to say, if you want to hate Edgar Casey and you want to hate the New Age, that's a good reason. If you don't like the idea that everyone has access to God, then you're not going to like the New Age. Because, in essence, that's what Jesus was talking about. The kingdom of heaven is within. He didn't say it's within me and not within you. He says it's within all of us. We all have direct access to God. We all can contact God. And I'd say that's one of the essential teachings of the New Age. And it's bad for business. It's bad. What do religions do? It's really God Inc., isn't it? <laughs> it's God Inc., the franchising of God. The religions, they all tell you that our religion is better. We have access to the penthouse of heaven. And if you want to go to the third floor, if you want, you know, if you want an inner room in the condo of heaven, go ahead and be one of the other religions. But if you want to get at the top, right next to God, then be a part of, you pick the name of the religion. And that's what, uh, that's the new age. That's the tenets of the new age, that we all have access to God. And I think that as souls, we have all gotten sick and tired of that franchising of God, of wars over God, over fighting over God. I mean, I don't know the, the overarching tenets of this fellowship, but I would think that, I would imagine that everyone is welcome. You know, if you're a Muslim or you call yourself a Christian or, you know, your avatar is Buddha, welcome. If that's what uh, helps you, if that's what guides you, if it's Jesus, if it's whatever it might be. Now, the Casey work has been uh, categorized as being very Jesus and Christ-centered. And I believe that while well, Edgar Casey was Christ-centered and Jesus-centered, if you go deeper into his work, it was much, much broader than that. Now, one of the concepts that came through Edgar Casey often was this term, the Christ consciousness. The Christ consciousness. And that uh, can be associated. You know, you hear Christ consciousness, and you're going to say, oh, well, that's a Christian. That's a Jesus based concept. But when Edgar Casey defined the Christ consciousness, he says it's a pattern that's in the mind, awaiting to be awakened by the will of our soul's oneness 
with its creator. A pattern imprinted in the mind, awaiting to be awakened by the will of the soul's oneness with its creator. Now, in that term, in that definition, I didn't hear Jesus' name. Did you hear his name? Did I throw it in there? Was it subliminal? Or did you hear Muhammad's name or Buddha's name? There's nobody's name there. It's a pattern that's in every mind. And it's awaiting to be awakened by your will, by your actions and by your choices. And this sleeping pattern is oneness. Is oneness. So the spirit is one. When we get into greed or when we get into division, that's the manifestation of separation. And so the New Age concept is trying to say, hey, let's stop worrying so much about what you call yourself and what religious tradition you belong to. Why don't we just start trying to work on some of these values? Why don't we start trying to emphasize oneness? Oneness. You and me are one. The values of oneness. Like, if you think about the people that you admire, I would guess that they are speaking in that way. That they're not speaking of hierarchy and power structures and division. Now I'd like to add to that. Do you know the Chinese curse? May you live in interesting times. <laughs> we are living in interesting times. It's a Chinese curse. It's, it's a blessing and it's a challenge that we're living in this time. Now one thing that's helped me you know, I, I swim in the deep end of the reincarnation pool. I do past life regressions. I've awakened a lot of my past life memories. And it's very helpful from a oneness perspective to realize the things and the people and the energies that I have been. And so I don't separate myself. I've learned with my work to separate myself less and less. I have been a woman. I have been different races. I have been different socioeconomic uh, standing. So what I stand here is just the leaf on a tree that has been, had had many, many other uh, leaves. And so right now we're all caught up. We're getting caught up in the political thing. You know, we've got, we couldn't have kind of more political chaos going on. We've got the supporters of Trump, and then we've got the supporters of Hillary, and then we have the angry, upset supporters of Bernie Trump, I mean, uh, Bernie Trump. Wouldn't that be nice, the love child of, uh, of Bernie Sanders? And so we've got these, these different flavors. But what, I, what I'd like to, see, I think that, what's that? The green, that's right, Jill Stein, we got her out there. What I, what I would like to offer you is my belief that, that I am Donald Trump, and I am Hillary Clinton, and I am Bernie. Sanders, and I am Jill Stein, and I am all of you, meaning that I have the light and the dark within me. And every day I try to feed the light, but I'm aware of the dark. I don't project it outward. And so I invite you to awaken to whatever it is that you dislike or, or reject, that that in some way is a part of you. You have to come to terms with that within yourself. And as you come to terms with that within yourself, you can be most useful in this time of the new age. Because we're at the dawn, we're at the beginning of this new age, we're at the transition point. And I think in the future, you know, thousands of years from now, this will be called the revolution. We are living through the revolution. I don't know, let's say, I compare it to the American revolution. You know, Edgar Casey said, there's never been a country founded on an ideal other than the United States of America. The United States of America was founded on the ideal of freedom. Freedom. That I were sick of the oppression of the monarchy in England. They came to a new land, they were still oppressed, and they said enough. And they built a government that, in a way, understood that power corrupts. And so we all get upset about how our presidents can't do anything. 
whether they're Republicans or whether they're Democrats, is because the structure is there, that there's all these checks and balances, and so it moves very, very slowly. That was part of the ideals of the founding fathers and mothers of this country. And so that gets called the American Revolution. And so we sit on the shoulders of our great-grandfathers and great-grandmothers that fought for that, that were part of that ideal and making that manifest. So Nathan Hale and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, they were rough and ready people. So when you begin a revolution, you need the rough and ready. Now, going back to Jesus, one of the things that Jesus taught, of the many, many things that he taught, is that there was a belief that the Messiah would come and be a liberator with violence. Now, when you talk about Judas, you know, there's a kind of a whole lecture on who Judas was and the soul contract that he had with Jesus. But just in a nutshell, Judas was a zealot, and he knew Jesus very, very well. He had seen Jesus escape death many, many times. And Judas, as a zealot, wanted to activate the liberator, his concept of a violent liberator. And so he thought that if Jesus was really, really trapped, he would act with the sword and not with the feather. And that was Judas's, however you want to think of that, that was Judas's role and Jesus came to liberate with love. It was a, revol a revolution of love and peace. And some of you may think, did it work? Did it not work? But that's the legacy that we're here. We're part of this revolution. And I think the revolution has to come forth with peace. It has to come forth with the highest uh, spiritual values. But each of us have to acknowledge our light and dark, to be fully part of this transition. And why is that? Because as the as bridge people, the, you know, if you look at like Alcoholics Anonymous, it's not the goody two-shoes that help the alcoholics. It's not someone who's never suffered that helps an addict. The sponsors have been there and done that and wrestled with their demons and they're in recovery. So the most helpful person to an addict is someone who has empathy and compassion, has been there, and has worked through to getting on the other side of that. And so that's what all of us need to be. As we are working with addicts, selfishness is an addiction. As we're working with the clothes addicts, the possession addicts, the money addicts, all of you are in the process of learning detachment, you know? You lose power, you sweat yourself to sleep, you know? You try to live within your means. You're trying to just get out of the matrix of debt and debt. But so many folks are caught up in that. The system reinforces that. The system wants that, wants people to be addicts. And so, as recovering addicts, if you acknowledge that you have been part of that process, either in this life or in the past, then you can be helpful. You can help people on, get to the other side of this. And I think that as the, as the forerunners of this new age, we are those people. We are the ones that they'll build the monuments to. When there comes a time, you know, the, we're living through the book of Revelation, when it comes the time that we can actually accomplish the thousand years of peace, there will be monuments to us. Like, oh my God, Francis was here. He chose to incarnate at the time of the revolution. And he, can you imagine what it was like? People used to kill each other at that time. And Francis drove a bus in New York City. Can you believe that? Can you imagine the energies that he must have encountered? Let's build a monument to him. He was part of that movement. And that's what all of us are here for. And so as much as this time is a time of hopelessness, 
You know, it's a time of, you know, if somebody tells you, this is the dawn of the age of Aquarius, good things are coming, and you look around, and you're like, are you kidding me? This is the dawn of something good? Well, you see, the ego thinks of one life at a time. You know, the ego thinks of 65 years, 70 years. You know, when I first came to the ARE, Edgar Casey has this promise that he says, you know, the human body is designed to live 125 years. I said, oh my God, that's fascinating. And he talks about how you can, what you need to do to live to be 125. So I would give talks. If I gave a talk about like aliens, 100 people show up. If I gave a talk about living to 125, like four people would show up. <laughs> and so I started giving surprise lectures. I didn't know. All of a sudden I'd start talking about 125, and I'd see people going, oh my God, 60 years of this torture is enough. I gotta do double that. And I started to understand because this is rough times. This is, we're all fighting the stream. You know, as above, so below. You know, Jesus talked, other avatars talk about, you know, look at what's going on in the earth and you get a sense of spiritual reality. And so I thought of what is this, what's the metaphor of the struggle that we're under? And I realized what came to me was the salmon. You know, the salmon spawns, is born at the head of the river, and it goes down the river with gravity and lives its life in the sea, eats those little shrimp that make it orange. And then there comes a time at the end of its life where it's time for the salmon to go home and to spawn themselves, to lay their eggs. And what do they do? They fight their way back up the stream. It's a dangerous fight. Many of them don't make it in that fight back home. And I think that's all of us. We go with gravity into the world, and we have our fun. And some of us are called to go back home. And that's not an easy voyage. Is meditation easy? Is that the easiest thing, to shut down your mind and move into spirit? You know, have you ever sat down to meditate and you look at your watch? 18 seconds. <laughs> well, you're like, I would rather go to the dentist <laughs> than sit with myself another 18 seconds. So that's the work of this fight back up the, uh, the stream. But my concluding thought for today is that we are all part of the revolution, the spiritual revolution. Casey says, there is a spiritual influence that must rule the world. Give thanks for being alive at this time where you can be part of making that a reality. So, thank you. Thank you.